You know, when I'm at breaking point, I always think of the difference between failure and success as the difference between being able to keep going or, or backing out. I have to push on because it's life and death. I'm driven by the desire to succeed. My commitment and focus overcomes my fears. It's as much about the mental strength as it is the physical. Thank you. Hey guys, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Ash Dykes, adventurer and extreme athlete. And it was about 13 months ago now that I came home from achieving my second world first, which saw me traverse the entire length of Madagascar via its central mountainous ridge. But before I talk about that, I just want to give you a brief overview on how it all begun and what steps that I found really helped me along the way to achieving them in the first place. So before all of these travels and adventures begun, I was actually studying at my local college in North Wales. It was a great course, but I remember all of the rest of the students in between year one and year two had already figured out what they wanted to go and to do next, and I was left completely confused as to which direction I was heading in. But I realized through that course that I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. I learn far more through experience, more hands-on, practical work. And I had this idea to, to head off traveling, to further develop myself, learn from different people, different traditions and cultures, test myself in certain scenarios. But that was all a lot easier said than done. I was only 17 at the time. I was working as a waiter. Uh, the little money that I did raise pretty much went straight towards my car. But I thought I've always believed in aspects like the law of attraction and visualization. And it was important for me to be able to see the end goal. But equally, I knew that it was just as important to break up these little sections and tick off each section step by step. And that'll eventually see me leave for my travels. And I did. I concentrated on getting my lifeguard in qualification. I found work as a lifeguard. I was on much better money now. Uh, on completion of my college course, I then sold my car. I bought myself a cheap bicycle and started cycling to and from work every day along the coast of North Wales there. I'm sure we all know how grim that is in the winter. And, um, and I started to see progression. And I also met... Uh, a friend in Life Garden who also wanted to come traveling with me, which was great. So we were working around 200 to 240 hours a month, every month for the next year and a half to two years. And each time I'd wake up at around four in the morning uh, to cycle to work, this is what I had on my wall, a big world map with, with photos of different destinations that I was heading to, with quotes along the bottom section to help motivate me and help keep me focused. And eventually we thought it's all good going out traveling, but eventually money will run out and will be forced to come back to the UK whilst everyone would have moved on with their lives and their careers. So it was now important for us to try and invest in ourselves when we started searching for different qualifications that would enable us to find work abroad so that we could, so that we could continue our travels. And, uh, and we did, we decided to become scuba divers, so we took on our open water, our rescue and advanced scuba diving qualifications. The next step was the dive master and this would enable us to find work abroad in order to continue with our travels. And about a year and a half to two years later, we finally ticked off that last box and set out for traveling at age 19. And this was amazing. We were checking the Great War. We were really soaking up the local culture. Uh, but it was only about one month into travels that I found that I was very much on the beaten track. I shared the same stories, the same photos and experiences as all of the rest of the travelers. And I just thought it'd be a little bit more wild, uh, a little bit more adventurous. So we ventured further down southeast, and me and my friend were pretty much sulking on the Mekong Riverbank because we had spent way more money than anticipated and hadn't taken on any adventure yet. Um, and of course, we're on such a low budget. And I said to my friend, that how about we purchase the cheapest and, and nastiest bicycles we could find and cycle Cambodia over to Vietnam and the entire length of Vietnam. And so the next hour or two, we spent uh, a while looking for these cheap and most ridiculous bicycles we could find, and we were successful. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, really bog standard, no gears, no suspension, a little bell and basket on the front. We found string on the side of the road that we used to strap our rucksack onto the back with. Uh, all of the locals were saying, you can't do it, you're crazy, you know, you can't cross the border without a tour guide, and that these bikes wouldn't make that distance, which was over 1,100 miles. It could have quite been right, I must admit. 
But we decided to go for it anyway. It's up to us to decide whether we can or can't make it by at least giving it a shot. And it was quite a reckless adventure. We only spent about two minutes research on Google and Wikipedia. Uh, we didn't have a pump or puncture repair kit. I'd probably always recommend you take yourself a pump. <laughs> And, uh, but off we, off we set across Vietnam, you know, it was really mountainous, hot during the days. Um, and we, we were chased by dogs, we were hit by mopeds, we were dodged by lorries. It was pretty extreme and quite reckless. But we'd made it after the bikes broke around 17 times in total. We made it to the capital uh, of Vietnam called Hanoi. And I was now hooked on adventure. I, I loved this, uh, and I didn't want to stop this. I found my niche, I'd found my passion, and I wanted to continue doing it. So I did, I ventured over to Thailand, I crossed through to Burma, utilizing the jungle, and, you, and learned how to survive in the jungle with the Burmese Hill Tribe, which was just incredible. Took various other adventures on across Southeast Asia and Australia. Uh, but Australia, we only lasted three months. We started missing everything about Asia, the locals, the food, the culture, how cheap it was, the, uh, the lack of health and safety. <laughs> and so we ventured back, but this time to India, right up north where we were doing treks in the Himalayas beyond uh, Srinagar on the border of Pakistan there. And as amazing as this was, money was now running low, and we had to act on our previous plan that we had here in Wales, which was to further develop our scuba diving and hopefully find work. And we were successful for the next year and a half to two years. I was working as a master scuba diving instructor in Thailand, teaching people from all over the world how to deep dive, how to dive at night, and how to dive through wrecks. It was a real good lifestyle. And I've always been quite competitive and looked to try and keep myself in shape. So whilst I was out there, I was also training and competing against the locals in the local martial art of Muay Thai, one of the world's most devastating martial arts. And this was great, but it started to get quite repetitive after a while, and I started missing my time cycling Vietnam, my time with the Burmese Hill Tribe, and I wanted to do something bigger and better than I'd ever done before. I knew that I wanted to do a walk, because I'd done plenty of cycles before, and I liked the idea of going to an extreme country that I was completely unfamiliar with, and solely surviving my way across, solo and unsupported. So I got the world map out, as you do, to, to look at what extreme countries stand out, and Mongolia instantly stood out, not because it was highlighted, because it wasn't at the time, <laughs> but purely because it was that country that I was completely unfamiliar with. And I wanted to walk maybe 100 miles or maybe north to south till I eventually decided to walk the, uh, the complete length solo and unsupported. And I thought the best way to go about this is to find those people who have done it before to ask for their tips and advice. And after doing extensive research, I couldn't find any evidence to suggest that anyone had completed a solo and unsupported trek across Mongolia. But I did find someone who had attempted, and he was the first person ever to attempt a solo and unsupported crossing, but was unfortunately evacuated after the halfway point, which really intimidated me because he was a Navy soldier and a desert explorer, and I have no military background, and I've never been to the desert before. But uh, I thought I'll reach out to him anyway, ask what dangers I should look out for, and he was a great guy, he did respond, although the hazards list was pretty intimidating. It was watch out for the grey wolves, the drunken nomadic drifters, the stagnant water, the dry wells, the snow blizzards, the sandstorms, and the list went on and on and on. And so I got the world map straight back out, and I was thinking, yeah, surely there's going to be a safer country, more populated country for me to walk across. But then I realized that just because no one's found a way to do it yet, doesn't mean it can't be done. <laughs> and as you can see here, here's my official GPS route. I couldn't go too close to the borders because there was a chance of me being shot, um, and I didn't want to be shot. So I decided to go from the most western city in Mongolia called Olgi, traverse for three weeks over the Altai Mountains, a further five weeks across the Gobi Desert, and a further three weeks again through the Mongolian steppe to the most eastern city called Choi Bolson. And after we started to do extensive research, and I met a logistics manager on the ground with extensive experience, we again couldn't find any evidence, and we realized that if I was to complete this, it would be a world first. So I couldn't have this be a reckless adventure like my previous one, especially the Vietnam cycle with no pump. I needed to give up my life in Thailand, which was difficult. I'd worked so hard to get to that level. I had to sell all of my dive kit, move back to, my, uh, back to the UK, back in with my parents with only a couple of hundred pounds in my account. Uh, but I wanted to make it happen. And now that I was back in the UK, I started surrounding myself with more people who had been to Mongolia, and it was all quite negative feedback. A lot of people saying, you know, it's not possible, it's not physically doable. 
Uh, and this started to really get to me, and as important as it is to, to ignore the, the people, I equally thought, well, I should listen to them, I should absorb what they say, but just try not to let it stop me. It was a lot easier said than done. And in fact, I had to get the maps out of Mongolia and really break them down. So here I am with my logistics manager. And this is the point that I said to him, which one of these days is it the impossible day? Which is the day that I fail? And after we reassessed every single day, we realized that every day was possible as long as you have the right water and, make the right, uh, and have the right food. He said the toughest challenge would be your mental state. It's the third most sparsely populated country in the world. There's going to be no one there to motivate you, no one there to help make uh, a decision. And so it was solely down to me. And I really took that on board. And the key thing for this expedition was, in fact, the preparation. As I said, like my previous adventures being reckless, with this, it was now trying to figure out why this hasn't been done, what challenges and obstacles lay in the way, and how I can best minimize these challenges to obviously make the expedition a success. And so I was sent myself out to the Alps. I was doing solo treks in the Alps. I was walking the length of Wales in the dead of winter, which was probably actually more hardcore than the, uh, than the Alps with all the rain that I got. And, uh, and I was telling myself I must mentally believe that I can do this before I physically put myself out there. If there's going to be wolves, expect to be attacked. If there's going to be sandstorms or snow blizzards, expect them to be the biggest. Not because I wanted to face the biggest, because of course I didn't. But at least if I was thinking of the, the worst case, and worst case was to happen, at least I'd somewhat hopefully be mentally prepared enough to, to tackle it. And so after a year back home, I managed to, to get everything ready, set to leave, and made it to Olgi, the most western city of Mongolia, which is my start point. And this was all of the kit that I was carrying, and this was all the provisions I needed to survive my way across the country. It weighed 18 stone, uh, or 120 kilograms, or the same weight as a baby elephant. So it was pretty heavy, um, but I needed it. It was my life capsule, and I set off knowing that if I succeed or fail on this project now, it's solely down to, to me to make it happen, which was really exciting. And after three weeks, I did make it out of the Altai Mountains. You can see now that they're just behind me. But I did face my dangers. I was hit by a snow blizzard. I was told by the locals that there were wolves hunting up ahead and that I'd be eaten alive, which was pretty worrying. Um, and I was now looking forward to the heat of the Gobi Desert. But I didn't get the heat straight away. I got hailstorms, sandstorms, had to stay completely covered until the weather did subside and I faced the biggest threat, not only to the expedition, but to my life, and that was the sheer heat of the Gobi Desert. It exceeded 40 degrees Celsius. There was no natural shelter, no natural breeze. It was really difficult to pull the trailer with the thin tires through the gravel and soft sand, and I was suffering with dehydration for a few weeks now, slipped massively into heat exhaustion, and was now well on my way to heat stroke, which is usually fatal. And it was at this point that the only shelter that I could find was actually underneath my trailer. I was running low on water, and the remaining water that I did have was now hot water. And it was at this point that the, the a settlement, which was four days ahead of me, was the only settlement that had the water source. And if I was to survive this, the only way to survive it was by completely walking my way out of there. Um, I realized at this point, if I don't keep getting up from out of my trailer after spending 45 minutes each time under it, I could quite easily die out here in the Gobi Desert. So that's when breaking the goals down played such a key part for this section. I allowed myself no more than five minutes under the trailer. I would get myself back up, strap myself in, and walk for 100, maybe 200 meters if I'm lucky, and then rest under the trailer for another five minutes. And although it was slow and painful progress, I was getting closer to that community until eventually, and very luckily, I did make it. I was in a bad way, off the radar for a good seven days, and trying to buck up the mental and physical strength to be able to keep going through the Gobi and up through the Mongolian steppe. But I did, and after 78 days and 1,500 miles, I did complete it, becoming the first person in the world to complete a solo and unsupported trek across Mongolia. Thank you. And this opened up a lot of opportunities for me, but what it allowed, more importantly, was for me to continue doing what I love, doing what I was passionate about, and that brought in Madagascar, which was the next big challenge. It's the fourth largest island in the world, two and a half times the size of the UK in terms of landmass. 80% of all plant life and wildlife found in Madagascar is found nowhere else in the world, so it would be such a unique expedition. 
I was luckily introduced to a logistics manager. He was pretty much the face of the island for adventure, knows all the far corners of, of Madagascar. And I asked him if he can help with logistics. I was planning to walk the entire length, knowing full well that this has been done before. Uh, but Jill said that there's a mountainous plateau lying centrally uh, east and almost the entire length of Madagascar. It's a lot more extreme, uh, more dangers. There's not as many people. There'll be more survival. And it's just asking to be walked. And so I had the idea to trek from the most southern tip to the most northern tip via the mountainous ridge. And with this one, when, when Madagascar usually comes to mind, what tends to probably feature first is, of course, the Madagascar <laughs> movie. But none of these actually exist there apart from, of course, the lemurs. And there's over 100 different species of lemur across Madagascar. Uh, and I'm all about, I never try to look at one man and his endeavor. I try to look at the bigger picture, help where I can with Mongolia. I was saving as much funds as I possibly could for uh, the Red Cross. Uh, with Madagascar, I partnered up with a tourism minister and I also partnered up with the Lima Conservation Network that help, they have 60 organizations on the ground and they're helping to protect and preserve all the unique biodiversity of the island. So I was there to help and meet up with the conservation and help spread the awareness. Because I'm all about along these journeys really trying to help others along the way. But just before we set off, we did obviously head down south to the most southern tip, Cap St. Marie, where the Indian Ocean meets the Mozambique Channel. And this would be different to Mongolia. I had a guide for the southern section, a different guide for the middle, and then a guide for the northern section too. But this was exciting. We were set off together. Uh, he is my guide, but he had never been this far south before, so we were pretty much in the thick of it together. <laughs> and, um, but I was looking forward to, to learn from my guides. I was self-filming a documentary. I was looking forward to, to get to know the different cultures and traditions, learn their survival skills before setting off. And it was amazing. We were coming across African communities living on the coast, Asian highland communities, of course, the wonderful different species of lemur across the island, uh, and of the creepy crawlies being the palm spider, very fitting. It is literally the size of your hand. Uh, and native to Madagascar, the giant comet moth, which is just incredible, literally bigger than this guy's hand. And it's tradition that in order to summit the highest mountain on the island called Maramakocho, you must take yourself a living white cockerel to the peak and set it free on top. And as I said, I'm all about respecting their traditions, so meet Gertrude. <laughs> <laughs> and Gertrude, we had to um, feed, give water, keep him alive. He became fully domesticated, was pretty much like a pet, followed us everywhere until we, we warrior on as a team and we did eventually make the highest peak. You can see him looking proud of himself in my bag. <laughs> and as I said earlier on in the talk, you know, ignoring the dream stealers, we had to be careful in Madagascar because the dream stealers would often come in the form of a crocodile. Uh, and we had, of course, a lot of river crossings and some having to build a raft using natural resources to, to get across these rivers. But I did face dangers, uh, I, of course. Uh, I had to persevere through a lot of different challenges and obstacles along the way. I uh, had to scramble out of a forest fire that was just behind us so we could escape the canopy. I was bitten in two different locations by a spider bite. Um, and I unfortunately contracted the deadliest strain of malaria, um, just managed to push onto a, a city in which the lady managed, uh, the doctor managed to eradicate it completely out of my system hours before slipping into a coma, so I was able to, to push on. Until we faced the jungles up north, and the jungles were really difficult. Often we would spend 10 to 12 hours a day walking and hacking through, only maybe we'd cover 1 to 1.5 miles uh, with machete in hand, completely opening up the track as we, as we go. Really difficult, really demanding. Everything seemed to be against us in, in the jungle. Truly beautiful, but truly harsh. And there were times that we would get completely lost in the jungle as well. Um, for example, it would take five hacks through one bamboo shard, yet we had thousands crisscrossing in front of us. We tried getting out of the jungle through many different directions, following the ridge round, following rivers, uh, going direct, and we kept falling back to our same spot. I was joined now by a photographer um, to get, some, obviously, some really good photos. She was only supposed to be with us for a week and a half, but she ended up being with us for over four weeks because we were in, still in the jungle. 
And this really sent us into physical and mental breaking point. Uh, we were, there'd be times at night that I'd take my shirt off to get a good night's sleep and I'd come across five to six fully f uh, filled leeches attached to me that I have to ply off and, and flick out. You can see the, the bite mark. Uh, everything seemed to be against us. We were battered, we were bruised, we were hungry, we were thirsty. And it was at this point that we were all at our lowest that all of the previous adventures that I realized played such a key part, all the previous experience from the, from the visualizations, the breaking the goals down, helping others along the way, and of course the mental and physical preparation, almost expecting this. I told these guys that all the previous experiences had something very much in common, and that was the breaking it down, managing your expectations and minimizing the risks. And I said, if we can only cover 50 meters an hour, then so be it. Let's share hacking duty. Let's hack through the bush for 50 meters before taking our next five to 10 minute break. And eventually, we will escape the jungle. Uh, and by keeping, uh, while well, at this point, we had lost all complete motivation, but it's fine, you know, we can't always be motivated, but we can be disciplined. And it was discipline that picked us up, keeping ourselves cool, calm, and concentrated to hack on through the jungle until eventually we did make it out of the jungle. I waved goodbye to the team and pushed on, and after 155 days covering 1,600 miles, I made it to the most northern tip of the island, becoming the first person to do so along the mountainous ridge whilst summiting the eight highest mountains. And I guess that these expeditions, they go to show that it doesn't matter if no one else can see it for you. It's important that you see it for yourself. No matter what dream, no matter what vision you have, you've got to go after it no matter what. Thank you.